Just a few days ago, I had the privilege of making an informal intervention at the Synod of 2018. So each uh, Synod father has a chance to give a, a four minute presentation. So I took that kind of precious time to talk about uh, a new apologetics. I took my starting point as the, um, the story of Jesus and the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, because I think it, it sums up in many ways the, the manner in which the church reaches out to people across the ages. So the story begins with two people walking the wrong way. They, they were disciples of the Lord, but now they're walking the wrong way. And it makes them like a lot of people today, especially in the West. People that know something about Jesus, but they're, they're wandering in the wrong direction. Um, Jesus approaches them, doesn't begin with judgment, doesn't begin by correcting them or reprimanding them. He begins gently, invitingly, you know? What are you talking about as you go on your way? And I think there we see everything Pope Francis has emphasized so beautifully. The church that listens, the church that accompanies, the church that doesn't begin with judgment but walks with people, look, even when they are walking the wrong way. So Jesus joins them. Uh, and they tell him what they're talking about, the things having to do with Jesus of Nazareth. And they give him all the data. But what are they missing? They're missing the form. They're missing the pattern that makes sense of the data. And there, again, I think they're like a lot of people today. You ask most people in the West about Jesus, they can probably tell you the basic data. You know, they, they tell you the story in its basic form, but a lot of them don't have the pattern that makes sense of it. At that point, Jesus, who's been accompanying them in this very, uh, you know, uh, inviting way, now turns with some force, upbraids them, you know, how fool you, foolish you are not to understand this. Didn't the Messiah have to undergo these things? And then it says, he began to lay out for them all that had to do with him in the scriptures. In other words, he begins to teach clearly, emphatically. So there, I think, is the beautiful rhythm you see in the life of the church. Yes, it listens, it accompanies, and without judgment. But then, at a key moment, it does teach. And you know, in my experience, so many young people, especially, are hungry for teaching. They're hungry for that clarity. So I took that as my starting point of how the church ought to do its work in this area. And notice that Jesus explains something to them. He's not just their, their friend, he's also their teacher. I know this from, you know, now nearly 20 years of uh, working online, especially with young people, reaching out to the agnostics, to atheists, to the nuns, etc. Very often, intellectual issues are keeping people from the faith. Look at survey after survey. You'll see it. When you ask young people, how come you left the church? They'll say, well, I, I just, I don't believe these things. Or uh, I, I don't believe in God. Or I think science has refuted religion. Time and again, intellectual reasons come to the fore. So I argued on the synod floor the other day that I think we need a new apologetics. Now, I acknowledge that for a lot of people, even in the church, the word apologetics is kind of a, a questionable word. You know, it seems like something rationalistic, something aggressive. Uh, this dates me a bit, but you know, the old commercial, the shell answer man, <laughs> this guy that had all the answers about your car, you know. So they would say, oh, the church should not be like the shell answer man. Well, I mean, I agree. <laughs> if by apologetics you mean something that's overbearing and browbeating and you know, I just got all the answers ready made for you, well, no, no one wants that. But at the same time, I think we'd be foolish not to see that a sensitive but clear, attentive but directive teaching is also a desideratum. Okay, so I said, what does a new apologetics look like? And I just noticed three things. I brought out three things. First of all, I said, it ought to arise from the very questions young people are asking. Now, I've spent, as I say, 20 years on YouTube and Facebook and various fora uh, I know what young people are asking. I, I've heard these questions over and over again. So I'm not proposing that we impose our ready-made answers on people. No, listen to their questions. And as I say, they have to do with God. They have to do with religion and science. They have to do with religion and violence. They have to do with the culture of self-invention. Like, who are you to tell me what to think, et cetera, et cetera. Just as, and I said this at the Synod, Thomas Aquinas began in the Middle Ages in these questiones disputate. He would listen to what people had to say. What, were, what was on the minds of young people in Paris in the 13th century? And then Thomas responded to those concerns. 
So, I argued, we should do the same thing today. It should be attentive to the real questions rising up from people's lives. Second thing I mentioned, we have to be very attentive to this issue of the sciences. It comes up again and again that science seems to refute religion or science is at odds with religion. And here's the problem, and I mentioned this on the Synod floor. For a lot of young people, the terms scientific and rational are simply coterminous, right? To be rational is to be scientific and vice versa. Well, the problem there is you take something like religion, which is not scientific, clearly, therefore, it must be irrational. One of the moves we have to make, I said, is to recover all of these non-scientific but deeply rational ways of knowing that literature, drama, architecture, poetry, philosophy are all avenues to truth. They're not just entertaining or diverting. They're truth-bearing. And that's one of the ways that we can engage this problem of religion and science, but also to look straight on at all the issues raised uh, by the scientific criticism. So that's the second dimension. Third thing, and I've talked about it before, I think a new apologetics should be very interested in the question of beauty. So the three great transcendentals, right, the true, the good, and the beautiful, in our postmodern uh, time, truth and goodness are often hard for people to take in because they seem aggressive, overbearing. Who are you to tell me what to think or how to behave? But the beautiful is, is far less threatening, it seems to me, right? As we show something that's beautiful, we're not, we're not telling you what to think or how to behave. But see, the beautiful is just as clearly a route of access to God because God is the supreme truth, the supreme goodness, and the supreme beauty. And I said this on the, on the Synod floor, that part of the genius of Catholicism is that we have so much beauty in our religion that we, we didn't jettison the aesthetic, but we embraced it. We should bring it forward, especially, I said, with all these new media that can portray the beauty of the church so compellingly. So those three things. And then, you know, I close by just going back to uh, the road to Emmaus. Their hearts began to burn within them as Jesus opened up the scriptures to them, as he taught them. See, teaching is not something that's opposed to the heart. No, good teaching sets the heart on fire. It did 2,000 years ago. It still should do that today.